Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in uh, and a very good afternoon. Um, this is our final version of Destination Discovery. And as luck would have it, uh, our final Destination Discovery series is on nature and wildlife. And it seemed uh, like Providence and it seemed like a great deal of good luck to have Carol suggest this um, lovely webinar on conservation-based tourism in Nepal, and which is why we are here today. Um, uh, RARE has always, uh, by default, RARE has uh, promoted conservation-based tourism. It was not something that en I envisaged in 2004. But as we progressed and grew, every lodge and retreat that came on board came in with some fabulous ideas and fabulous operations where sustainable travel is concerned. Uh, because they were all in the vicinity of forests and uh, nature uh, or uh, um, uh, protected areas, uh, there was a great deal of involvement with the uh, with protection of the uh, uh, with the areas and forests around them, and there was also a great deal of interaction with the local communities. For what Rare promotes today as conscious luxury travel, so welcome to this session uh, of, of uh, destination discovery. Uh, the, 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 uh, the theme being the richness of small things, Nepal's conservation and tourism journey. I've been to Nepal quite a few times and I'm sure a lot of you are from Nepal and a lot of people who have joined in as, uh, as uh, tour operators and travel agents have been to Nepal as well. Its quaintness, its smallness, the extent of its diversity, the landscapes and cultures, Nepal's potential for tourism is not only natural, it, is, it also has that quality of um, simplicity. It's also very genuine. 2020, 2020 is, uh, is supposed to be the Nepal, Nepal's year for tourism. And with this COVID situation, I think it will be a double, it will be, a, you know, a double whammy and also a great challenge for us to showcase why um, and how this can really uh, function as, I mean, this, this year can really substantiate as the uh, visit Nepal tourism year. Meanwhile, our visibility towards uh, Nepal's tourism economy has been uh, reaffirmed through lodges and retreats such as uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus uh, um, uh, you know, heading Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge. And very recently, I came to know about Hems uh, Lumbini uh, uh, Buddha Garden. The conservation uh, idea, ideology that Marcus and him bring into, um, uh, into the running or operating their lodges is um, uh, is a sto are stories in themselves and today going by the uh, people who have signed up uh, is is great academic information as well uh, for tour operators who are here it is also a great idea for you all to take back as um, because this conversation about sustainability and conservation being a big part of post covid travel is growing and it is no longer a conversation you can miss uh, this idea was primarily Carol's, and I must thank Carol for it. And welcome, Carol. Welcome, uh, Carol, uh, on board, uh, the celebrated author and ornithologist. She says she it is not only the only birds that she's interested in, and in a bit she'll tell you what all she's interested in. Um, Marcus has been a great um, inspiration for me personally. Uh, he's also been, I mean, I was telling Marcus today when I was talking to him that He's also been a great inspiration to a lot of people on the rare community. His ideas on sustainability and how sustainability should not stop at the doorstep of a crisis is something, is a big takeaway personally for me and also for a lot of people who are a part of the rare community. Uh, so without wasting too much time, uh, this is my short introduction to Marcus. You'll know why we really respect and we love what he does at Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge. It's one of the most exceptional lodges that you can see. The way this uh, form, the format of this uh, webinar today is that uh, Marcus will introduce uh, Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge to you with a, with a series of, um, uh, with a series of uh, slides, which uh, Sunil will be presenting in the background. Uh, then uh, Marcus will introduce him, and him will introduce uh, Carol, though she doesn't need much of an introduction. And then we will have a conversation. 
all your questions uh, are uh, please uh, kindly post your questions on the q and a or on the chat box i'll pick it up after the uh, conversation is over um and just a few housekeeping rules uh, though we muted you from uh, from the uh, from the technology side from our offices kindly keep your uh, keep yourself on a mute mode so that there is no disturbance uh, thank you so much thank you for tuning in again we have about 180 participants from all over and we welcome you to this session marcus over to you thank you shobhana shobha it's it's a great pleasure to be here today and thank goodness for technology that allows us all to communicate and talk even in these times of crisis. Well, I'll just introduce Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge. We were established in 1998, opened by Sir Edmund Hillary of Everest fame in that year, in October. We're set on a ridge about, about almost a thousand feet above the Pokhara Valley in central Nepal. And the lodge boasts a magnificent panorama of Daulagiri, Annapurna, and Manaslu Himal, as you can see in the picture. Um, sadly, I can't show them to, them to you live today because we've just had a thunderstorm and it's pretty cloudy. But they are very beautiful, as seen there. Our founders, Tiger Tops and Mountain Travel, bequeathed us with a, with a rich legacy. And we've evolved that innovation tourism. Tiger Tops provided us with the grounding in wildlife safaris from their heritage in the magnificent Chitwan National Park down to the south in, in And mountain travel Nepal gave us the experience of hill walking and exploration of the Himalayan foothills and the high Himalaya, looking at both culture and obviously wildlife and natural things up in the mountains. This was merged at Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge to forge a sort of combined focus on wildlife and culture through day hikes with expert local guides. This suited our location as we're roughly midway between the Annapurna Himal to the north and Chitwan Dune Valley to the south. And latterly, we've added elements of well wellness and mindfulness, as well as a focus on authentic um, Nepali food. So I move from being the general manager at Tiger Tops, responsible for the Jungle Lodge, the Tented Camp and, and Taru Village, in, up to Tiger Mountain in late 2001. It was an interesting transition, looking back. At the time, I was too focused on immediate issues and needs and tasks to, to realize this transition happening. But from operating wildlife safari lodges in a protected area, with all the backing of laws, guards, guns, etc., to a village setting where the flora and fauna and the community aspirations were very different. No tiger, no rhino, no elephant. But wonderful flora, a rich bird and insect life, and a fine community forest surrounds the lodge on three sides of the property without obscuring the view. So I, I came to realize that the need was to refocus and shift the scale. So working with the wonderful team of guides at the lodge led by Jalak Choudhury, we've evolved to focus on the richness of small things, hence the title of today's conversation. So as well as birding with guests, the guides lead regular monitoring of birds, especially the annual waterfowl census for BirdLife International which we've led and coordinated since 2004 for the Pokhara Valley Lakes and send all the data to HEM who then uploads it to BirdLife International. And with monthly butterfly counts within the seven acres of the lodge grounds, which we've been doing since two, consistently since 2005. The rise in citizen science and apps like Cornell's eBird or iNaturalist have been a great help and encouragement but we also maintain all our raw data here at the lodge, largely to ensure consistency of recording down the years. That continuity of research and our approach to operating the lodge has I think been our key. It's an immense privilege to see the staff evolve. Over 80% have been here since 1998. Um, and to see how from a flat start where we were all roughly equal in responsibility, leadership roles have emerged 
and have been very efficiently filled. Also, it's super to see how the staff have embraced responsible tourism in its sort of modern avatar and have made the lodge one of the leaders in the field in Nepal. Responsible tourism is the only tool I know that we have that can square that apparent circle of in ever increasing travel in spite of the coronavirus as a time to pause and recalibrate. So ever increasing travel versus cultures, communities and the natural environment. Therefore, to that end, I think it is essential. And this is such a strong point within the rare group of lodges and properties, as, as Shoba was saying earlier. To that end, we at the Lodge both verify our responsible tourism performance with Yardstick UK, which was set up by Jennifer Bobbin, and she did it based on her postgraduate research work here at Tiger Mountain, looking at her, how we handled responsible tourism and what we did and how we monitored it. We also certify our standards with a Global Sustainable Tourism Council affiliate, Travel Life, and we, get, we got gold standard in our two audits undertaken in 2017 and 2019. The results of that audit only came in last night. So it was a bit of very nice timing for us today. The credit for this goes to our responsible tourism manager, Ishwar Basnet, who is tireless at encouraging the staff and keeping us motivated. Over the 20 years that I have been involved with the lodge, the trees have grown, thickened up, they're no longer locked for fodder. The grassy hilltop has been restored to its traditional form as a thatched grass meadow. The habitat is now an excellent combination of subtropical Shima Castanopsis forest and both long and short grasslands. I particularly love the short grasses in the late spring and early summer when they're covered in tiny bright blue gentian flowers and look absolutely lovely. We've listed over 340 bird species around the lodge, the Pokhara Valley, and the adjacent hillsides. And this has provided the data for the national checklists of birds of the Pokhara Valley. Likewise, with butterflies, we have seven acres of grounds and we've, we've recorded 285 species of butterfly. And every year we're finding one or two more or something different or unusual. We've also seen yellow-throated martin, Malayan and porcupine, Indian hare, barking deer, various snakes and amphibians, three species of civet, jungle cat, one was sitting inside the bar one evening, and a common leopard that sat on the terrace for a while. That excited the staff, I can tell you. So we have some middle-sized things as well as the small things. In conclusion, I would love just to make a very public thank you to the, all the 36 staff at the lodge and our Kathmandu office, they form the team that has, makes everything happen, that embraces and implements responsible tourism. Not to mention putting up with me for the last 20 years, that really was a challenge I, I set them. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Hem Saga Baral, country representative for the Zoological Society of London and the world's oldest zoological society, who leads their diverse program in Nepal, looking at the ecological richness of all things, large and small. Hem and I go back many years to the days when he was an excellent naturalist at a jungle lodge in Chitwan, and certainly gave Tiger Tops naturalists a great run for their money. It's a pleasure and honor for me that he's been able to join us today in this conversation. A warm welcome, Hem. Hem, you're muted. Uh, Hem, you're muted. Thank you, Sama. Ah, thank you, okay. thank you, thank you, Marcus, for that lovely introduction. Um, and um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be speaking in this uh, webinar. And uh, as, as you say, um, I, I work for Zoological Society of London and I manage its conservation activities. And I, I have to say here that I, I do wear multiple hats, you know, and one um, full-time job with the Geological Society of London for the last seven years. And the other uh, hat I wear is uh, for the tourism industry. 
and I have been involved in tourism for the last 30 years, actually as long as uh, uh, my um, CV goes for conservation. And in the past, I have been involved um, um, setting up different wildlife lodges, running them, um, some eco lodges, including the Lumbini Buddha Garden that uh, uh, I will be talking about today, uh, about its feature. So uh, first of all, you know, um, everybody knows the Lumbini is the birthplace of Buddha. We all know that. And it's the place where Buddha spent 30 years of his prime life before heading to seek the enlightenment. And uh, in Lumbini, many people think that it's only the birthplace, but birthplace of Buddha, it's there, but there are many ruins that have historic, historic value and that are worth seeing. And one of them includes the palace um, that uh, belongs to uh, Buddha's father, the Suddhodan. And there are, of course, various other structures, including Ashokan pillars, um, you know, which signify, the, uh, uh, signify that that's where the Buddha was born. And Kudan Monastery, you know, the ruins of the Kudan Monastery, and that's where uh, Buddha met his father after his enlightenment. And Ramagrama, another place where Buddha's ashes were buried, one of the few places uh, where his ashes after he was uh, cremated, was, where, was buried. And, and um, Devdaha, which is the maternal uh, home of Buddha. So there are many places actually um, in Lumbini, uh, which is in central Nepal, as you all know, uh, that many places to see than just the birthplace of Buddha. You know, in, because Buddha died in the 80s, and uh, before that, um, he did spend nearly 30 years, and which is quite a significant time period um, that he spent, and it's uh, worth visiting, and they're pretty well preserved. Um, so that's really the, um, about Lumbini, you know, what are there to see. And basically, I will just go back to um, the kind of short uh, history, how I set up the Lumbini Buddha Garden, the eco laws that we are talking about today. Uh, so, in the early 2000s, I was deputed by uh, the then director of BirdLife Asia, Richard Grimmett, actually, Carol's very good friend and also my friend, to do some kind of ecotourism study in Lumbini area. And Lumbini, um, not being close to a protected area, it's quite far from a protected area, but it still had a lot of uh, birds and biodiversity, which uh, Carol will talk about later. And reach, I'm thankful to Richard that he did uh, give me a small project to study ecotourism prospects in Lumbini. And that's how I became interested in Lumbini. When I went there, there were, you know, really high standard losses or very budget type of losses. And of course, you can imagine I stayed in the budget type losses. And, uh, you know, when one goes to Lumbini, they try to, um, they try to feel the peace. They try to look for peace, you know, the tranquility where Buddha was born. And, and that is staying in these places. Unfortunately, I could not really gain any of that experience. And then I thought, you know, either they're big, really expensive one or the very, um, 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 budget type one and there is a niche for the medium range laws to be set up and to cater and to cater in a very uh, responsible way you know responsibly uh, managed laws so I bought a piece of cultivated lands basically to begin with which had few mother trees and uh, I put a fence and uh, built 10 rooms in a small corner of that land it was about 10 acres of land and uh, I, I let the rest of the place to take over by nature. And uh, even if you go now, um, most of the area is still occupied by nature. When I say nature, it's a kind of semi-wild nature. It's not really the pristine kind of thing, but you know, restoration kind of uh, area. So most of our structures we have, they blend completely in the surrounding. It's now turning into essentially a nice botanic garden kind of 
uh, place for visitors. And we have over 300 flowering plants and uh, at least a couple of hundred species of birds have been recorded. I don't have the, uh, the, the facts and figures that Marcus provided for TMPL. Um, and of course, about birds and other things, Carol will highlight uh, later because she has visited the place many times. So we employ locals and we also promote uh, handicrafts that are made by uh, local people. Um, although we buy most of our supplies from um, local, pa local farmers market, we also maintain small organic vegetables and fruit uh, orchard. And, um, you know, a um, lot of lodges, they uh, term themselves eco lodges, you know, responsibly run lodges. But I think one has to really look at the operation uh, side to it, their um, operation and uh, what are their kind of uh, social uh, responsibility, what kind of um, uh, contributions they have made, you know. And so it's quite important. Therefore, we, we manage our... Uh, a lot of our environment very sensibly. For example, the waste, we have the biodegradable waste and the leaf litters that we collect. We, we uh, make compost in mud pits, you know, we have set up. And, um, and the most important thing I wanted to say this, uh, in this August uh, gathering is that I think we are the only uh, laws or one of the very few lodges in Nepal who have started uh, the um, scheme of groundwater recharge. Because, you know, when, rain, when it rains, what happens is the, the upper layer, layer of the ground is saturated very quickly and most of the water is uh, that runs off towards the stream and the water does not really penetrate the interior. And so to facilitate, facilitate that water to get into the deeper part of the soil, we have, um, we have started making uh, recharge stations, you know, nearly six feet deep, uh, four feet wide, uh, put with gravels and sand and facilitate water getting into the deeper part of the earth um, um, easily. So it's, uh, that's really, you know, some of the things we, um, um, we are doing uh, in the mini and um, unfortunately I don't have the butterfly list again, you know, that very kindly uh, shared by Marcus for TMPL, which is, of course, we are following the footprints of TMPL, Marcus. So, so it, it, it's a fantastic place, uh, you know, uh, not only for uh, the biodiversity, but also for the traditional uh, agri agrarian communities who, who live there in the lowlands and it's a fantastic place to study their lifestyle. And of course, a lot of birds and uh, biodiversity um, is there. Um, so talking about birds and biodiversity, I think uh, I will let that part uh, to be um, um, briefed by our uh, legendary uh, friend, Himalayan conservationist, uh, uh, Carol Inskip. I have known um, Carol. Uh, since the late 80s and uh, um, actually I first uh, went to see her in a newly bought house at Welney in, in 1990 Zoom and uh, she told me that I was the first guest in a house once they bought that house but I don't know whether that's true or not but um, Carol can tell that later. So Carol has visited Nepal more than 20 times and trekked areas I have never been to. And um, I think, you know, she's allowed to do that because uh, she started birding in this country 10 years before me. So she is definitely visiting more areas than me. Uh, and she has written, as you all know, a number of bird books with her husband, Tim and Skip. And it's my fortune that I, I also have co-authored some of the books um, together with Carol. Carol's memory is rather frightening compared to mine. So please uh, welcome to Carol um, for the next brief. So Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ham for that, um, that 
uh, rather overwhelming introduction. Uh, I, I, I would like to say that, um, y yes, I have written uh, some field guides with my husband Tim and Richard Grimmett, and also several uh, books on Nepal conservation, uh, and all but one of those uh, him, I've co authored with you. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's been, it, it, it's great working with, with you. So, uh, yes, I, I first visited Nepal in 1977 with, with my husband, Tim. And uh, as you can imagine, there have been huge changes in Nepal, in, in Nepal, in Nepal tourism in, in that time. Um, there are hardly any uh, Nepalis, I think, hardly any, very few Nepalis in 1977 that had knowledge of nature conservation or interested in wildlife conservation. And there's a huge and growing number today, which is so, so I find extremely encouraging. Um, there weren't any, there are many more places to stay. There wasn't anywhere like uh, like T Tiger Mountain, and I, I mean, Tim and I loved staying there, um, and especially the the, the bird watching walks, w which we had with um, with your uh, very knowledgeable and and competent guides, Marcus Nepali guides. And as Hem said, I visited uh, Lumbidi Buddha Garden many times, and uh, this is always. You know, it's a very enriching experience, as Hem said, it's a very peaceful place to be. And uh, one of the things I like about it was is all the uh, trees and shrubs that have been planted there that provide fruit and nectar for birds. So you can wander around the gardens, they're very tranquil, watch the birds, and uh, many raptors flying overhead too, which, which is exciting. So, I want to talk a bit to you about how do I start with the, with all the changes that have taken place, I thought, in that time. But I, I, th I think I can do that maybe best by uh, talking about my visit to the Annapurna region. That was the first trek. It is the most, uh, I should say at the outset, this is the most popular area in Nepal for trekking. And understandably so. It's got, uh, it reaches from the subtropical forests, broadleaf forests, all the way up to uh, the Arctic ice and, zone, ice and snow in the Arctic. So great range of habitats, a fantastic, beautiful mountain scenery, unbeatable, I would say. And uh, it's also because of its wide range of habitats, there's a uh, a great range of wildlife as well. For instance, it, it over 500, well over 500 bird species have been recorded there. So Tim and I visited first, uh, in my first visit, uh, my first visit to Nepal in 1977, and we walked up to, to Muktinath, which is uh, nearly 4,000, 3,660 meters, I think, from Pokhara, which is 800, 800 and, 50 meters, something like that. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, we, we could have had a porter with us, but we carried our own bags, or rather Tim carried um, more than 75% of the weight, to be honest. And uh, yeah, so uh, there, were, there were a few lodges. And when we got all the way to Muktinath, to Addis May, uh, it was December, I should say, so Muktinath was cold. And uh, there was no, the, the, uh, I think there was only two lodges then, they were both full. So we had to camp and we had such a trouble getting the tent bags, I remember, into this icy ground. And some of the, the local Nepalis helped us banging with stones. It was so cold that night. Um, now there are many treks, well, several treks in the Annapurna area you can do. And one of them, Tim and I did in 1986, and I repeated exactly the same trek in 2016, 30 years later, with my friend Mary. Number one, I was really pleased I could still do it. Uh, but also, I did notice a, a great lot of change in, you know, in exactly the same, uh, that same route. There were more lodges. But in that time, in, in 1986, 
the year we uh, the year we did the, the that first trek the Annapurna conservation area project was started and that is um, based on that that project is run by the National Trust for Nature Conservation in Nepal as many of you know and it has a community based conservation approach community based conservation and development approach I should say and uh, so the changes well in in 77 and and even in 1986 you know the the hygiene and the, you know the toilet and the the washing facilities were almost non-existent totally different in 2016 um, so that was that you know that that was a, gr a great improvement and we in in our two earlier trips we we used to get our water from streams but put it in our water bottle with some chlorine tablets which was really inefficient way of, uh, of of getting clean water and i think can can lead to uh to illness though i have to say i've almost never been ill when i've been in nepal but uh it can do anyway and uh, but but in 2016 uh the lodges actually provided us with clean water so you gave them your water bottle and and they'd fill it up for either for free or for a nominal charge now then, in, in the 1990s and, uh, and today, the plastic, you know, plastic, uh, plastic bottles, waste plastic bottles are, a, you know, are, are a major issue. Well, they're a major issue here in the UK, but they certainly are on, 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 on trekking routes. So this provision by lodges, uh, they won't actually sell you it's impossible to buy bottled water in the core area of the Annapurna conservation area, you, you know, but they will let you have the, the, uh, the clean water that they provide for you. So I think that that is a, a, a great step forward. But uh, just as impressive was the change in habitat. And um, I have to admit, before we set off, I was expecting the habitat to be degraded compared to 30 years before. I was expecting and but the opposite was true because in the 19 in the 1980s um, Nepal set up its community forestry program up to that time um, uh, the forest had been owned owned by the government sorry I should say that I, between the, I think it was the mid 1950s until the 1980s, the forests were owned by the government. Originally, traditionally, the forests were owned by the people and they managed them and looked after them. In the early, in the mid 50s, the government took over um, and the forest became, became de degraded. The, the local people ceased to care for them. But when the community forestry project took hold and now it's widespread in the middle hills the local people now have responsibility for the forests themselves and the forests have not only spread but their in their quality the forest quality is improved there's more shrub layer more of a herb layer and that was you know that was very very obvious to me uh visiting the area again now then, another thing that I think Nepal has to offer, which, uh, I mean, when, when I first went there, I, I was taken aback by the beautiful and varied insect life, but I didn't have much interest in it, to be honest. Uh, but that interest is, has, I, I've always been interested in birds, but um, in the last 10 years or so, uh, I've, I've now developed a passion passion for insects. And Nepal's got a huge number of beautiful butterflies, dragonflies, and other, other insects. And uh, some Nepali naturalists are now able to, uh, to tell you, uh, you know, what, what you're looking at, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, very, 
very encouraging as well. I should also say that in 2016, we took uh, a porter with us, Mary and me, but we also took a nature guide. So you can have a nature guide on your, on your trek as well. And I do really recommend that. It adds so much to the experience. And finally, if I've got time, I just want to say just a few things about homestay. In 2018 and this year, uh, earlier this year, I, uh, uh, for several nights, I, uh, I used Homestay. Now this is a relatively new initiative in Nepal, but I do really recommend that as well. Um, I stayed in Dabate in Ilam district. And this is, the, the village was surrounded by beautiful broadleaf temperate forests. And then uh, in uh, earlier this year, I, I stayed in Chitwan district in two villages, Lower Cowley and Upper Cowley. And now they've just started homestay. And, uh, you know, so what, what are the advantages of that? Well, it means that you meet local people and uh, you can learn about their culture. Uh, you're supporting the local economy. And if they, they realize that you're staying there because you're interested in, in the wildlife and in the surrounding forest, they're much more likely you know, to protect them. So I, I think there's a, a great future for homestay in Nepal. And I cannot, uh, one more thing, I, I, I usually stay in small lodges. Um, and I did this, when I wasn't staying in homestay, that, that's where I stayed this time. Oh, and, and in Hems Lumbini Buddha Garden too. Um, the small lodges, uh, some of these are family run and, uh, and, and to me that, that's one of the really um, most enjoyable experiences I have actually. And there's one that every time I come to Nepal, this is in uh, Saraha, Gaida Chitwan Lodge, every time I come to Nepal, I stay there. Every visit for the past six years, I, I, I enjoy it so much. Right, I think that's all. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Uh, so we, when talking about um, uh, the richness of small things, one of the things that we highlighted and we spoke about how interesting and how engaging it is to stay in local homestays. And uh, uh, Marcus uh, and the community forestry bit, Marcus and him, would you, would you like to talk about how you engage the local community, the training part of it, how independently um, enriching it is for you as a lodge owner and how it is for the, uh, the travelers who come, and, uh, who come and stay with you? Okay, yes. Um, thank you, Shoba. Absolutely. I think one of the key things that we really focus on in, in, at Tiger Mountain is making sure that the lodge is not alien to the community and the community alien to the lodge. So there are various things we do. For instance, um, apart from now, sadly, with the coronavirus, though as soon as possible, we'll get back to it. You know, villagers can walk through the lodge. People can be shown around, see what we do and, and why we do it. And, and the guides who take them around are also very key on getting across small conservation or responsible tourism messages, like the issue of you won't see litter around here and how we recycle it and how we support mothers groups in the community and things like that. So that accessibility of the property to the community and vice versa, I think is important. Interestingly, when I moved up here, um, one of our guides said to me, look, you know, these ladies in the village are really kind and they're giving our guests um, and visit do village and cultural walks and we, we should pay them. And I thought a bit and said, no, if we pay them, it'll be like porters outside a station or, um, you know, it's outside Kathmandu Airport pulling everyone to come to my lodge, come to my hotel, take my taxi. I said, I want it to be genuine and authentic. And as such, um, the vital thing was if we pay, hurry, bring your guests my way, bring your guests my way. 
So yeah. don't let's do that. But let's equally say we never ask anyone in the village for a cup of tea either. It's entirely that person's decision to do it at that time. So that it is an authentic and spontaneous um, response. Um, similarly, I think I've seen in Nepal, there is historically a danger, and I'm sure it applies in a lot of developing countries, where, where we call the donor test the and so not wanting any community support we do to be done just because the money was there, just because we could provide some money. So, so it was vital that, that the community had ideas of what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do it, and we would support them in that order. And actually we, we tend, and Harry, one of our guides, leads our community support partnership. Um, first, has the government given all the money that, that, is in, that the village is entitled to under that budget head? Second, what is the community doing to raise support in time, labor, money? And third, then what can we do? And that way, there is ownership within the community. And I think that is so important because that's the only way you have a chance of good sustainability in a project. So I think that that's what I say, and it is enriching because it's an engagement that sees development. And in our community particularly being relatively close to Pokhara, education has been the key element. And we've seen an improved secondary school. We've seen teacher mentoring in the primary school. A lot of great things happen that are very much closely um, related to, to our guests, our community of the Lodge and our village community here. Thanks. Absolutely, absolutely. Hem, you, you want to add something on that? Yeah, I think um, I pretty much agree with what uh, Marcus said. And I just wanted to add, you know, listening to uh, Carol's uh, presentation, you know, I think how things were changed in Annapurna conservation area. Uh, I guess in the 70s, when um, people were going there, there were a lot of uh, litters and uh, um, not really good management of uh, the tourism um, aspect. And, you know, I think uh, I just want to link that uh, part with the setting up of this uh, Annapurna conservation area as a protected area. And uh, how good, if managed well, that can deliver, you know, in terms of enriching the experience of tourists visiting these uh, areas and um, in a government of Nepal and you know National Trust for Nature Conservation um, which is uh, managing the uh, area at the moment they have done really wonderful job and actually um, I, I was quite lucky uh, you know uh, to be involved as a technical uh, team member to set up this uh, Gauri Shankar conservation area which is east of um, Kathmandu Valley and um, I want to talk about this also, just linking, because in 2009, when we were doing survey there, there were hardly, you know, some tourists going there. But now in 10 years, you know, that tourist number, 200 or 300 at that time, has uh, increased by 10 times. And that's, uh, that, you know, once that part was declared as a conservation area, as a protected area, then the people, do want to visit that. So it's the goodness of declaring a protected area because people associate that with the better management for tourism, you know? So, so, so Gauri Shankar uh, Conservation Area has that huge um, tourism potential. Benefit, and, potential, yeah. Put it, benefits. And, it, it, and just, just to finish, you know, of all the tourists that come to Nepal, 60% of the, those tourists visit protected areas in some Yes, I, I so read that's, that. That's yeah. a huge, uh, huge, that's uh, a huge number, yeah. Numbers, you know. So. Yeah. One more uh, question I, I had uh, for all of you, including Carol, is that in the conservation-based tourism model, uh, the, I mean, tr very most, more often than not, the role of the traveler is quite discounted. I mean, but... Uh, in, in my opinion, and I, I've been talking about this, um, uh, you know, in various forums, that the tourism has, the, the traveler has to see himself as a contributor. He has to contribute to the tourism economy, not only by contributing physically in terms of revenues and things like that, but also by ensuring that he respects the place and the pristine quality of the destination remains as it is. 
and that is one of the things uh, you know that one of the takeaways from uh, you know uh, owner run lodges such as yours and marcus is that's one of the uh, you know one of the things that that's a, which is a huge takeaway and which is also true for a lot of the rare lodges that we promote that you walk away as a traveler feeling that you are a part of the community yes i i if, if i could just uh, start by answering that uh, yes, yes i i i i agree and i'm glad i got the opportunity to talk about the contribution of, of you know of of the traveler um you have to uh, I, th I, th I think it's so important that, as you say, you know, it, when you walk away, you realise that you've actually contributed economically, but also that, you know, the people that you're staying with, that, uh, you know, that you've respected them, you've respected their culture. Um, I mean, some... Uh, and that you're not trying to do things as cheaply as possible. I mean, when, when Tim and I first went, you know, I said we didn't have a porter, you know, we carried our own things. In 1981, actually, I didn't talk about that visit. 1981, I went to the Annapurna Conservation Area on my own, and I was proud that I carried my own rucksack, but it was quite a struggle. And everywhere I went on that trek, I'm meeting these, uh, you know, local uh, young men mainly, Madam, let me carry your bag. I said, no, 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 I can carry my own bag. And then afterwards, I, I realized I'd got it all wrong, you know. I didn't need to prove to anyone I could carry my own bag, which, as I said, actually gave me a horrible backache, to be honest. And I couldn't bird watch properly. You know, why didn't... And ever after that, you know, Tim and I, we always uh, had uh, employed, you know, local people to carry the the bags uh, and that contributes to the economy. At the same time, when you do that, you have to be responsible. You are an employer. You have to have a responsibility uh, that you don't try and, and make the, I mean, you can get laid. Okay. Don't make them carry, you know, too much. Give them a good tip at the end. They expect it. They, they, you know, they deserve it. And then, uh, and that, you should make it your business to find out what local customs and culture, you know, is like. Um, and uh, it's easy enough to find, you know, travel books, you know, you know, will tell you. Um, I mean, one of the things uh, that impressed me a lot, you know, was the paper handkerchief. You know, they're British, right? Westerns are always using paper handkerchiefs. But I didn't realise that... Um, that actually, you know, for Nepalis, they they find this, you know, it's 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 offensive. And what you don't do, and I remember I dropped mine by accident, actually, you know, on the trail, and uh, this um, uh, guide, you know, we had, he just looked at it as if it was some kind of, you know, what a mess I'd made, and he walked all the way round it. And uh, I thought, gosh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll be much more discreet, and I'll never, uh, drop or throw away, you know, people do it at home, they just chuck paper handkerchiefs. It's, you know, that that's a small thing, but, you know, that's... Um, and and also, I think, you know, if you can, uh, you know, talk to the people where you're staying and let them know, you know, how much you value the, the their environment and behave there as you would at home. You know, I think it's a, a lot of people don't actually behave more badly. Don't don't throw don't throw your rubbish. Put it in your bag. Take it back. Take it back. Yeah. And Absolutely. really minimise the use of, of plastic. Yes. Um, yeah. anyway, you know. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we have a slew of questions. Uh, uh, sh can I start on questions, Carol? Should I do that? Some of them are uh, directed at you. Oh, right. Okay. So, okay. So let's begin with one that is for you. Um, um, so one question to Carol, ma'am, if she can share her experience uh, with Tika Ram Homestay, which she revisited recently. Tika? Tika Ram Homestay. Tika Ram Homestay. Um, is that... Uh, this is probably Tika's laws, maybe. Yeah, I think I mentioned it. This yeah, is... Okay. I mentioned <laughs> it already. That is the... Um, that is the place that 
uh, I always, in the last six years, I've visited Nepal every year. And uh, I've, I've always visited, uh, with one exception, in the monsoon time, actually. I've always visited uh, Chitwan. And when I do, I always stay there. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a family run lodge and it's like a second home for me. Fantastic. Yeah. Here's another one for you, Carol. In a situation when homestay is growing very aggressively in Nepal, and this is, uh, I mean, quite a valid question because we see that happen in Ladakh and other areas as oh, well. Yeah. How do you see the future prospects of high value, low impact tourism in Nepal? This is from uh, Mitra Bandhu Podal, um, uh, editor high, Nobel Business high value. Uh, Review. Right, high value. How well, high value, low impact tourism in Nepal. How would you, how, how do you high see value. the future of high value, low impact tourism? Um, what do you mean like homestay? Uh, like homestay mean, where uh, we are not really uh, fighting uh, pricing here. Uh, you know, the, the value yeah. we place a value very high. Yes. But so I, quality I think, and numbers are, the quality is high and the numbers are low. That's what it is. The means. numbers are low. Uh, yes, I think it does have a, have, um, you know, have a good, you know, a good, a good, a good, a good future in Nepal. That, um, I guess, I mean, at a homestay, you would, you would, you wouldn't have a menu. In my experience, you don't get a menu. You don't say, you know, you, you can't say, you know, well, I'd like my coffee. I like it strong. I like it like this. I like my egg like this. You get the local food, you know, the food that they, they eat. And for me, that's, that's part of the experience. And I really enjoy yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's a homestay experience. Yeah. Yes, a homestay experience. Yes. But um, they're not going, you know, not everyone is, uh, you know, I think we have to accept that, 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 that that, that that not everybody would you know want that um that they that you know they would not be parted from their western food uh, yeah yeah him uh, the, the no. uh, what it also means is that uh, in a scenario where every third or the fourth house in a little village becomes a homestay instead of promoting uh, the value of a particular homestay of my own home i will be price fighting pricing so the price of the homestay doesn't uh, go up and that's uh, that's the point that i mean as a as a lodge owner you probably are better equipped to answer that i think yeah thank you it's a it's a kind of um it's interesting you know uh, because uh, uh the homestays are seen not to replace the high value you know that kind of um, um, lodges you know hotels because um, I think what we have to envision is uh, envision a world where there are homestays as well as the high value, high end kind of losses, you know. Uh, so it's a, and uh, they cater a different a niche, different group of tourists. Because, uh, you know, as Carol said, maybe not everybody would like to have, uh, uh, you know, Nepali food every day. You know, they would uh, crave. Uh, their own Western type of food, which the other, um, uh, you know, kind of hotels do. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, the concept of home stays is, you know, that has come because uh, mainly to uh, bring up the rural economy, you know, especially in the buffer zones, especially in, um, you know, village settings where people are given the basic training, you know, on hygiene and hospitality. And with a very little investment and a little bit of um, kind of um, making up within their houses and whatever the resources they have without much investment, the local people can engage in uh, making income because at the end, what matters is we can talk about protected areas and national parks and this and that, but if the local communities don't get income directly, you know, what, from the you know, tourism, own, yeah, from, from the, the tourism. Husband. Yeah. from the hospitality trade they don't really see the value yeah. you know yeah so, but, but the point so, also uh, yeah sorry him uh, the, the point is also that this is they do not switch over to tourism as a homestay owner you are supplementing your income you know and there is a question to that effect which says running a lodge or homestay with local people is great initiative but major problem is maximum time local people divert their uh, way into other jobs and activities. According to my, my conservation, according to me, conservation is a process 
my question is how motivated local how do you motivate local people for conservation and protect the culture in a responsible way um can i can i say on that yeah go ahead yeah so so basically you know that's um, you know that is the area you know tourism is for wildlife conservation tourism is one of the very safe ways that we see we can uh, show as the is the way of income for local people you know there are government agencies the national park department national park the ntnc iucn wwf uh, organization my own organization jeta self we all see that as the kind of sustainable way of uh, getting the income to the to, to the yeah. to village people but we don't see that as the ultimate thing you know and uh, uh, it's one limited houses limited number of houses they yeah. get it's not the entire villages because not everybody will have that kind of uh, facility and uh, standard to be operated as operated. Is. but but then who regulates this Marcus. i mean with homestays how do you regulate this uh, marcus i mean yeah go ahead um uh, shobha thanks um i think there's several points that have come up in this conversation first is that um because homestays are regulated as cooperatives within communities the price issue doesn't occur second to answer the question about of um, mitropodel about high high impact low value low impact high value tourism, tourism yeah. i think nepal's tourism model has different facilities at different budget points and and this is where we are today we're not bhutan we didn't start from a zero sum base as we are today therefore actually to provide excellent quality and value and experience at the low middle and high budget range is very important and i think also with homestays they are as important there's no difference between a homestay and a high end lodge like tiger mountain in terms of being responsible responsibility sustainable tourism are the same the the nuances of implementation are slightly different but the basic principle of being committed and i think this is where it's vital and i'm sure is it's certainly what the big international charities and the government are doing here is inculcating that concept of sustainability within the homestay market um right from the beginning and this is good and i think as as carol will remember you know at the end of the day the early lodges in annapurna on the trekking trail were homestays they weren't called homestays at those times but they started as homestays home to lodges and what is the difference between a small and a homestay the fan moved out into their own property and the lodge the building that was their home is now a full time lodge so i i think those are points really okay. really um clear on okay, there is a Yes, thank you, Marcus. There is a question from a student um, uh, directed at you. My question is, Marcus, how can we students contribute to conservation for from our research when the funding is not available or is insufficient? I am working for leopards in a small part of Middle East for my graduate program, but due to lack of funds, I am unable to conduct research smoothly. It's a huge constraint to have fruitful research. What can a researcher do to fulfill a gap? that that's a brilliant question i think it was from chap called ram yeah yes ram thank you ram parajuli yeah ram parajuli that's fantastic it's a really good question now obviously i can't answer the question of funding that is an issue maybe hem can talk about whether there is funding from academic and other institutions he'll be more knowledgeable but um how you contribute to conservation well i think i i once gave a talk to the postgrad students at the institute of forestry in pokhara and and started by saying that that original conservation and to all the great studies done in nepal um what what like brian hodgson for instance as the british resident here he wasn't a biologist he wasn't an anthropologist he was all of them but he had no ist after his name because he was an amateur and and i mentioned in my little talk citizen science and i think one of the things that researchers it is a perfect balance between 
citizen science by the true amateurs like myself. I'm an amateur. I'm not qualified in any technical aspects. And the technical guys like Ram Parajuli doing his research. That balance of the amateur enthusiast and the technical scientist is very important. So I would say to Ram, perhaps the most important contribution he could do for conservation, as far as I see, apart from just the way he behaves in his own life, is to make sure that his paper and all his research doesn't just stay in rarefied academic circles, but is shared out widely. Share it in the communities where he's been studying. Share it with us responsible tourism lodges. Share it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, we are almost, uh, I mean, we uh, have actually run out of time, but there are a couple of uh, questions that are um, directed at you, which I'd like to uh, share here. In particular, ecotourism in true sense needs to be considered in action, not only on slogans, thanks to MG and Marcus D. How shall Nepal's tourism sector, how, how does Nepal's tourism sector need to adapt? This is from Ram is that it's for both of you, for both uh, him and uh, for him, both him and for you, Marcus. So, okay, Marcus, maybe you can highlight that. Uh, okay, um, Ram, thank you. Very good question. I think the most important thing that tourism as an industry can do is far more sustainable. To be far more conscious of the importance of sustainability. In or a tiny lodge on like Tiger Mountain or a homestay halfway up a mountain, it makes no difference. Being very conscious of sustainability, what it means, how you in great and small ways can move forwards. Carol made the very great point about not having plastic and the campaign Say No to Plastic is one simple and effective step forward. So I think those, those are the sort of things. Tourism must move beyond green and this to living and breathing sustainability today and that is what i mean by response just takes responsibility for its absolutely hem. Um, uh, hem. Uh, yeah i think you know i i you know agree with the marcus i think uh, you know the responsibility lies with everybody i think you know um the traveler, the law owner, the community, everybody. I think, you know, it's the um, overall the environmental conservation. And, I, you know, so if everybody practices, you know, then I think it's, um, you know, it's the better future for the sustainable tourism. You know, it's not just uh, one stakeholder doing it and everything will be all right. So. Great. And uh, two quick questions before we wrap up. Carol and this, I'll, uh, this is for you. Uh, does the panel see any merit, and this is from uh, Amar Grover, he's a journalist from UK. Does the panel see any merit in introducing a code for, say, trekking permits, similar to what happens in Peru's Inca Trail? Would responsible, sustainable tourist uh, concerns be better achieved with this kind of model? Um, what do you mean a code for, a, a code for the traveler? A code, yeah. A, a code, code for, the, for the trekker, yeah. A yes. Code. I I think if it's you know worded if it's worded if it, <clears throat> excuse me if it's worded the way it's worded would be be be, be an important but yes I mean I, I you know when I first came to Nepal I you know, had no idea uh, it's, it's, quota. it's not it's a quota. quota it's a quota it's a quota, it, it's quota he's referring yeah. oh code quota it's a quota yeah. sorry I didn't hear so, so even I, I didn't read it correctly yeah sorry my, um, my yeah I miss I miss uh, I miss heard a quota oh so a sort of limit um well well yes that that you know, I have I have had the experience where there are too many. That's what he means. There's too many uh, tourists. Yeah. Yes. Well, that certainly has has been an issue. Has been an issue in the past. Um, but then, how to how to decide what the quota would be and who would decide? That was quite um, difficult, actually. I, I guess. Uh, yeah. would you, uh, him, would you, would you? Well, I guess, you know, this is a very uh, important question, but also very difficult to answer, like Carol is, uh, you know, who will decide the quota and how, at what point we decide that, for example, 
underwater conservation area, which is 7,000 square kilometer Lars, you know, will, uh, you know, will need this much uh, of tourists, you know, otherwise more than this will be impacting negatively, you know. I think that's a quite a, uh, it's an interesting angle, you know. I know some parks um, have that, some areas have that kind of quota, but um, again, you know, that's, uh, um, it, you know, how, how we do it, it, it will be a uh, kind of question. And the other thing, actually, I just want to link it is, you know, some kind of quota is practiced already in terms of the Jeep drives and things like that in Chitwan National Park. And if there are too many Jeeps um, going into the park, then the, uh, the authority tries yeah, to- Yeah, but it, it's kind of based on a pre predetermined uh, carrying capacity studies, right? So uh, that's the other, we have another question from Melanie Masaro. In some, con I, in some countries, there are issues with too many tourists, though it might not be the case in Nepal. But sometimes it is better to cap the number of tourists to one location. I mean, again, pointing to what you're saying, you know, the numbers. And Amar again says, um, in Peru, it's first come, first serve, simple. And you kind of cap it at a point. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you know, those, um, those are, of course, you know, um, one of the measures to control the... Uh, tourist numbers and being negatively impacted. But I think it's the biggest thing is the management in our country. You know, yeah. if you look at the number of tourists coming, it's not huge. You know, look at number of tourists coming to Thailand. You know, I mean, it's, you know, what they get in one month, we don't get in one year, you know? Yeah. And it, it's just the management kind of uh, thing. But then uh, that doesn't really mean that uh, we, we have increased the number. I mean, for that kind of exclusivity, we are not charging them more also. So that's the other question. That's the other thing that we come to where somebody was talking about uh, value-based tourism, you know, high value tourism. Um, uh, uh, Marcus, just uh, one thing um, which I would like to, um, which I'd like to point out is that when we're talking about numbers, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, how is how are we going to uh, with the COVID nineteen situation there? And we kind of we wrap up with this uh, particular question, which is imminent to all webinars: is how does this um, the number, this, the uh, the all that we spoke about, the homestays, the uh, independent lodges? How does this uh, contribute, or how does this uh, the scenario for tourism look in a post COVID uh, world? So him, Carol, Marcus, just to wrap up. Let, let, let Marcus lead on it. Yes. With his yeah. big wisdom. Yes. Yeah. You've been doing a lot of work on uh, Yeah. I think, well, yes, it, it is new. I, I'm skeptical of the new normal expression purely because as humans, we tend to revert to type and revert to past practices. But let's see. I'm hopeful that it might be a new normal and, and uh, that then new normal will really focus on sustainability and tourism and putting it center stage. I think that is one of the key things that I think this great pause and recalibration in tourism that COVID has brought on, this can be the silver lining to the dark cloud of, of COVID. Um, it gives us time to rethink. And, and this idea of sustainability applies across the board. It doesn't matter what aspect or element of tourism you're in, um, whether you're even airlines and things that might be seen as high CO2 emitters, they can be more sustainable. They may not be brilliant, but they can be more sustainable. Um, I think creating value chains where you link communities, tourism operations, porters, everyone, all the, the human and supply value chains together is a key element um, and working together with a common purpose to produce a better model of tourism. Post COVID, I suspect that tourism will be more local initially and more regional before the long haul comes back. So domestic tourism, which is rapidly on the rise in Nepal, is there. Now, a lot of that may have been fueled by remittance. The remittance and with large migrant workers coming home, there may be less revenue disposable for domestic tourism. We'll have to see. Other than that, I don't think we can really plan in detail. We have to just see what are the upshots? How is it going to evolve? We don't know enough about the virus yet to see whether we're going to get second and third waves or what's going to happen. 
So until such time as either that happens or we have a vaccine or something, it's difficult to answer that question in great detail, except to say that we can be safe, we can, be, we can adopt the precautionary principle and, and try and be far more sustainable in all we do. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Carol, hey, do you want to add to that? Um, so I think, you know, just, uh, um, just supporting what uh, Marcus said, I think uh, post COVID-19 is very much going to be a domestic market. I think we need to be exploring and um, maybe regional. Uh, because as he said, as Marcus said, long haul flights are kind of distant uh, thing. And um, uh, I guess we have to learn to live with COVID-19. I think that is, this is my take on COVID-19, other may differ. Because, you know, we, we cannot just say that we are going to defeat something that we don't see through our eyes. And many, you know, scientists uh, working around the world, you know, they are not finding even a single clue on it, you know. So COVID is going to stay, but we need to devise our precautionary preventive methods and run our tourism in the best interest for everybody. I think that, that's my yeah. take on COVID-19. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, just briefly, yes. I would just like to support what uh, Marcus and him have, have said. And, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with all of that. And I especially, now I believe that we need, we will need to learn to live with COVID-19. It isn't going to go away, I think. Yes. Yes. And um, there are going to be, in, yes, uh, I, I think that Nepal will have to look at to its national tourism in the domestic tourism, I guess, in the near future. There'll be people like me, a lot of people like me who will be desperate to get back to uh, Nepal, the Indian subcontinent that I love so much. And as soon as um, I'm uh, allowed, you know, I'll, I'll be on the plane. Um, but who knows what other people, they may be planning already where they'd like to go when, when, when this uh, initial pandemic is over. But we just, I just don't know about other people, whether they'll be more cautious um, we'll just have to see. Um, but we need, as Marcus said, to think of, you know, how we can manage sustainably now. In the yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Carol. Thank you, Ahem. And thank you, Marcus, for making this a wonderful conversation about sustainability and also, uh, you know, training the spotlight on the uh, the model uh, of tourism that you have seen in uh, Nepal, which is uh, conservation based and inspired by organizations like Tiger Tops and Mountain Travel. Thank you for that information, Marcus. Um, as you can see, the richness of small things goes from, you know, uh, treading softly on the land that you're based in, uh, you know, engaging in activities that not only impact the local environment, but also the local communities, understanding the local culture, being with people, understanding local festivals and crafts, a lot of small things that contribute to making a great, um, uh, to, to making a, a great travel experience. Uh, thank you for joining in everybody. Like I said before, this is um, one of our destination discovery series. It was fantastic to have Carol Haim and Marcus on board. Um, please join us um, for, uh, for uh, Instagram and live chats uh, shortly, both tomorrow and day after tomorrow. And by the way, Carol, uh, June 5th is the World Environment Day. And uh, thank you for oh, yeah. all your contributions there. Haim to you as well. And Marcus, thank you so Th much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.